the shuttle program first started, uh, we we signed flight readiness statements for, you know, must have been about 15 different uh, different parts of the software, you know, for and um, then as as that software matured and and the uh, and stabilized. Uh, we would sort of drop off and it no longer needed anyone to sign the flight ready statement. The flight ready statement said basically the software we designed uh, applied to the mission as defined will be safe to fly. And so we're basically writing us, signing our names to the fact that this, uh, this will work. Um, uh, as the uh, shuttle program, uh, as the flight control system evolved and we had to keep upgrading the system over the years to again handle more and more challenging payloads, uh, that kept us in the game. So we were, you know, one of the few uh, contractors that uh, that stayed on for the whole life of the program, in fact, signed flight readiness statements all the way up to the very last shuttle mission. So more than 100 flights where we designed a controller and and oh, really a perfect record of success, and that you know, we didn't really have any any real difficulties in what we designed. That all did work as we planned. Uh, but things really got interesting when we uh, deployed the Hubble Space Telescope because um, the uh, the plan there was to uh, you know, erect it up out of the payload bay on a, on a support stand, but then deploy the solar arrays uh, and then l let it go. And the, uh, the solar arrays are, are very fragile. They got the strength of about a carpenter's tape, so a very low buckling mode. It doesn't take much to, to snap those arrays. And we had early on determined that if we, we weren't careful about how we fired the thrusters, we could actually, you know, damage the solar arrays. So it was something we paid a lot of attention to. But, but that mission was, was very successful. Uh, only to find out that the uh, once the Hubble was deployed, that it had a flaw in its optics and basically was useless as a as astronomical telescope. After its initial launch, actually making the mission a success at all because it was an optical mistake that uh, some very clever replacements for one of the science payloads enabled correcting. That was possible because the optical mistake was done perfectly. <laughs> so that the correction was able, relatively easy to make by essentially putting another lens in there. Uh, before they could fix it, they had to go grab it and put it into the shuttle payload bay. Uh, so I remember the, this very well because it, um, one of the major surprises of, of my life was when uh, I was actually on vacation. I had scheduled a vacation day, uh, vacation week actually, to go down to the Virgin Islands. And I scheduled it on top of the mission because NASA never launched on time and I knew that I'd probably be pretty safe by scheduling that because it would always slip. Well, it didn't slip this time, and I ended up uh, having to watch it on CNN at uh, 4 o'clock in the morning. And everyone in the house is asleep, but I creep over to the television, and I, I turn it on at 4 o'clock in the morning. And the first picture I see is a picture of the space telescope with its solar arrays deployed, but very noticeably there's a kink in one of the solar arrays. And I thought, oh my God, we broke it. I thought we had you know, grabbed it and somehow muffed up grabbing it and somehow we had mismanaged the thrusters and something had happened. And I called up Doug and Doug Zimper, who was in mission control, and said, Doug, what happened? And he said, don't worry, <laughs> it, it wasn't us, it was that way before we got there. It turns out that the, uh, just the fact of the, every orbit, the uh, telescope going in and out of sunlight, that thermal swing had been enough to snap the solar array, or buckle the solar array, and didn't really snap off. What the, uh, became clear very quickly was that the, uh, the whole concept for the shuttle, which is it's a truck to take uh, payloads up into orbit and drop them off and then, uh, you know, maybe sometimes pick up a payload in orbit and bring it back home, uh, was not going to be enough. It really, they found there was great value in hanging on to the, the, the uh, spacecraft they were deploying and testing them out fully while still attached to the shuttle before they let them go. And that raised a whole number of uh, you know, dynamic interaction problems. We've got this uh, flexible structure, basically the orbiter attached to a payload by some compliant mechanism uh, that uh, will vibrate. And, uh, and whether that connection is the, uh, the, the tilting uh, platform that was on the inertial upper stage or it's the shuttle arm that was used to deploy a lot of the payloads, uh, they're very, very low structural frequencies involved and they start to get into your what's called the rigid body bandwidth and that makes it a very difficult thing to control. Well, When you have the arm out there it's a mass moving around and of course you're in an environment where it moves, the vehicle moves in response. You put a payload on the end of the arm, it moves, the vehicle moves more in response because it's the amount of momentum you're transferring in one direction with the arm, the vehicle's got to compensate for that. So you've got this big slowly moving 
thing flopping around in space, yet you're trying to control it with some precision. And you're trying to do that with a set of, uh, of uh, thrusters on the shuttle, which are bang-bang thrusters. There's, you know, they're they're nonlinear thrusters, either on or they're off. So you got basically a nonlinear structure and nonlinear thrusters and a nonlinear control system because we had a phase plane controller, and all of that made it, um, you know, made it uh, a, a challenge to do. Uh, so when uh, we first started doing this, we would analyze every mission and every operation, and and uh, it, that quickly got to be old. We came up with a, a way of using uh, very narrow, called notch filters, to to be able to um, uh, basically eliminate these structural modes from the control system, and and that worked worked very well. Um, the difficulty, of course, was that these, you know, figuring out where these modes were, where the frequencies were, the vibration was difficult because we, you know, we're using models for everything. So lots of rules, as they went more in the more complex uh, operations, they began to realize were lots of rule changes. They would have to have procedure changes regarding how they handled payloads, what they did with the autopilot uh, during payload operations, and those got ever more complicated up to the uh, Mir missions and the space station mission. As we were talking about, one of the major challenges was making sure that the shuttle-induced thruster firings did not damage the space station. And the way this damage would occur is if a shuttle jet fired, the station dynamic system, say a solar array, would start to flex. Now, if we fired the next thruster at the wrong time, that flexure would start to grow until it grew large enough that you could actually break the solar array off or damage the solar array. But on the flip side, if we were able to time our firing patterns correctly, the next firing, rather than exciting the structure and causing it to grow, would actually damp it out. So that about every other firing, you'd see the excitation, and that then it would damp out with the second firing. The third firing would excite it a little more, and then it would damp out. So in principle, that's pretty simple. But one of the difficulties with this is there are over a hundred significant flexure modes on the space station. The shuttle was supposed to go to the space station. They had no idea that it was going to be this highly extended tinker toy like with these big flexible appendages. The kind of space station concepts you had back in the 70s was you had you know, a bunch of pieces you put together on one sort of ball kind of node and uh, you wouldn't have expected that you'd be worried about breaking anything. So you had to actually find little troughs in the dynamics where it was the right time to make the firing and it may actually hurt one mode a little bit but it wouldn't hurt it much and then it would damp out the more concern and we'd have to tune those firings up so that we didn't excite any of those modes significantly to cause damage. Well early um, in the space station program there was an election. We had a new president. Bill Clinton was elected and one of his desires was to collaborate with the Russians on space station and space station freedom was changed to the International Space Station that you see in space today. A key element of that was to work with the Russians. The Russians would build part of the space station and NASA would build part of the space station. So as a step along that way, it was decided we would fly nine missions for the space shuttle to dock with the Russian Mir space station. And this would be a training ground to learn how to operate, how to work with the Russians, and to collaborate for building the International Space Station. The first uh, shuttle Mir docking mission was STS-71, and and the numbers indicate how many shuttle flights had flown before that. So we, this was the 71st shuttle flight. And we got docked to the Mir. We're all just extremely thrilled. We'd gotten through all the docking operations. It worked like a charm. Hoot Gibson had flown the shuttle up there and docked it. You know, it was a very celebratory time, and it was wonderful. And we had turned on our control system, started controlling. We had looked at the first data. Everything looked exactly like our simulations. It was looking great. So I headed back to my office, and between walking from uh, the mission evaluation room, which is an engineering back room to the famous mission control center, back to my desk, there was enough time to get a phone call. So I pick up my voicemail and, you know, listen to this voicemail, and the response was, hey, Doug, you need to come back over here. Uh, we're burning about twice as much propellant as you guys had predicted it would be. And I'm like, no, things look great. I mean, it was very stable. How can we be doing this? Well, it turns out after about 20 hours of digging through the data all night, we were able to figure out what had actually happened. And what had happened was on the shuttle, when the jets fire, there can actually, they can impinge on the aerosurfaces the shuttle uses to fly for when it lands. 
and there's a body flap right underneath a couple of the jets, the small jets on the shuttle. So every time we fired those jets, we were hitting that surface. Well, that was modeled and we had a model of that and we could model how much of the downforce was being negated due to that surface. What we had never realized was there was actually an X component of that impingement as well. And from that, when we actually docked to the mirror, the center of gravity of the combined shuttle and mirror had moved up about 10 feet from where it normally was. So that X force now actually gave us a torque. And we had never modeled that torque, so all of our predictions didn't know that was there. And this small force, and the force was actually four tenths of a pound, actually was enough that it was causing us to double the amount of propellant we were using. And actually, we were able to figure it out respond to the mission teams and let them know what it was and then actually modify slightly our control configuration so that we could offset for that for the remainder of the mission. But it was just something that had been there forever but nobody had ever seen because we had never been in that configuration. That was a perfect example of the kind of lessons we learned by doing these early Mir missions with the Russians. The second example of working with the Russians was just the difference in philosophy. NASA is a very rigid, thorough, run lots of simulations, you know, prove everything will work philosophy. The Russians took more of a build something to be robust, feel comfortable that it's going to work. So when we undocked from the mirror for the first time, somebody thought it would be really cool if we took the Soyuz, put the crew from the mirror in it, and flew it out of plane and took pictures of the shuttle undocking. We never had had that God's eye view before of the shuttle undocking or being around a payload in space. So we got this really cool picture, and it's still up on my wall. It's really one of my favorite pictures because it's the, really the only one that exists of that. And it was great right up until the Russians lost control of the mirror. So the Russians now have an uncontrolled mirror rotating around in space. Their crew's in a Soyuz undocked. The shuttle crew's flying away, and we're all like going, this can't be good. So we get on the, the phone, you know, on the voice loops with the Russian control center, and I talk to my counterpart over in Moscow, Yuri Kaznicheyev, and I'm like, Yuri, what's going on? You're uncontrolled, this is, you know, what, what's happening with this? And Yuri's like, Doug, calm down. We're celebrating, this was a successful flight. Can't you hear the champagne bottles tinkering in the background? It's like, Yuri, but you, you're out of control. And he's like, don't worry, our crew can redock. We've proven it, we know we can do this. Just calm down, go have a drink, it'll be okay. And it's like, uh, okay. Needless to say, the NASA managers didn't all completely agree with that philosophy, but sure enough, the crew flew the Soyuz back to the mirror, was able to dock with it. Everything was fine and the Russians were right. So there were a lot of lessons learned from the shuttle mirror program, both technically as well as how to work together. And I believe it really laid the framework for how NASA was so successful in working with its international partners, the Russians, the Japanese, and the Europeans, the Canadians, as they went forward and built the International Space Station. We ended up with uh, really four major roles on the space station. Uh, one was doing the, the flight control, and you know, part of it was part of the shuttle role, because whenever the shuttle was docked to the space station, the shuttle's really controlling the whole structure with just the shuttle thrusters in order to save fuel in the space station. Uh, the other main role we had was with the command and data handling system, uh, and to help write the software for that. So we were, we were part of the team there. And then we also had a role in essentially validating what the Russians did uh, on their part of the space station. So uh, on the space station itself, it's the Russian modules that do the on-orbit attitude control, and we helped uh, to validate that what the Russians did and their, that their analyses were good and that uh, we had confidence that uh, in various configurations that the Russian systems would, would, would work well. And then the last role we had was uh, with the timeline of language, which is a sort of an adjunct to the, the, command, the uh, command data handling system. So I think one of the notable things about the space shuttle, it was de designed to be highly reliable. I mean, these vehicles had to be reused, as originally envisioned, hundreds of times. Uh, and so to do that, uh, uh, there had to be a, a way to make the, the overall vehicle reliable and able to tolerate failures and keep on operating in a reliable way. So almost everything was uh, you know, sort of in, in, in triple on the shuttle. The, uh, the, the power system, the electrical system, the flight control system, um, uh, everything had a backup and usually a backup to a backup. Uh, and all of that came together in a, you know, a, a very um, 
sophisticated uh, data processing system that, that uh, represented the uh, sort of the primary avionics subsystem, basically a set of um, uh, four flight computers that would uh, operate together. And this is a direct outgrowth of the work that we did on the digital fly-by-wire program. Three IMUs where you only needed one at any given time. We had 38 primary jets, and many of those were there in case some of the others failed. We had the two orbital maneuvering engines so that if one failed, the other could operate. If both failed, we could go. That got into a new realm of having to do fault management. There was a lot of functionality that was new in that regard put on the shuttle, limited by the processing rates on of the computer. But what we were really after in this case was um, those things where a human could not respond fast enough. We would have autonomous fault detection and reconfiguration of the system by deselecting a thruster, selecting a different one, or, sh you know, shutting down one ohm's engine and switching over to just operation of the other if they were both on or just shutting down the burn and alerting the crew to, uh, as to whether or not they wanted to use the other engine. Uh, so th this was a whole new realm. Uh, we had a um, lot of logic and uh, I would say, you know, by the time the program was done, I would say w way over half of the effort in developing the software went into accommodating the fault management, both because you had to figure out what were the faults you were going to deal with, how are you going to design for them, and then verifying for the range of circumstances under which you would think they might occur that you did properly respond or that you properly identified the problem at all. And It was a quantum leap uh, to be able to have that kind of uh, fault management functionality and uh, I think people began to appreciate that while fault management was a wonderful thing, it was a software cost driver, something that um, I don't think had been fully appreciated uh, previously.